So we're about to do the reading of the first 50, what we do prior to every joining. <clears throat> and I'm just taking a moment, just wanted to say this at the beginning of this recording. I've had the opportunity to speak with some people recently who've seen the recordings and um, have wanted, thought it was a private thing. It's not. So I just wanted to extend the invitation for anyone that would like to join. You're welcome to join. Um, you can reach out to me. Maybe you can just leave a comment below. Or you can reach out to me or Dave. I'm Tina with a Y. Tyler on Facebook. Uh, and Dave Fair on Facebook. Uh, yeah, we would love for you to join us. So just wanted to say that. We're going to take a moment more in my talking. Um, again, just allow Holy Spirit. We do what it does. <laughs> Feel the space. Then that invitation. And if anyone feels to start reading before I'm calling anyone, please feel free. Nothing I see means anything. The reason this is so is that I see nothing and nothing has no meaning. It is necessary that I recognize this, that I may learn to see. What I think I see now is taking the place of vision. I must let it go by realizing it has no meaning so that vision may take its place. I have given what I see all the meaning it has for me. <clears throat> I have judged everything I look upon, and it is this and only this I see. This is not vision. It is merely an illusion of reality because my judgments have been made quite apart from reality. I am willing to recognize the lack of validity in my judgments because I want to see. My judgments have hurt me and I do not want to see according to them. I do not understand anything I see. How could I understand what I see when I have judged it amiss? What I see is a projection of my own errors of thought. I do not understand what I see because it is not understandable. There is no sense in trying to understand it, but there is every reason to let it go and make room for what can be seen and understood and loved. I can exchange what I see now for this merely by being willing to do so. Is not this a better choice than the one I made before? <laughs> Ha! <laughs> 
These thoughts do not mean anything. The thoughts of which I'm aware do not mean anything because I'm trying to think without God. What I call my thoughts are not my real thoughts. My real thoughts are the thoughts I think with God. I am not aware of them because I've made my thoughts to take their place. I am willing to recognize that my thoughts do not mean anything and to let them go. I choose to have them be replaced by what they were intended to replace. <laughs> My thoughts are meaningless, but all creation lies in the thoughts I think with God. <laughs> trying to mute myself. <laughs> it's not working. It's like read more. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> okay. yeah, I will. It's not necessary, but Boom. <laughs> I'll do a couple. Mm. Mm. I am never upset for the reason I think. I am never upset for the reason I think because I am constantly trying to justify my thoughts. I am constantly trying to make them true. I make all things my enemies so that my anger is justified and my attacks are warranted. I have not realized how much I have misused everything I see by assigning its role to it. I have done this to defend a thought system which has hurt me and which I no longer want. I am willing to let it go. I'm reading from the COA too, just um, there was a couple of things that were different I heard. Um, and see all these slight differences and call me out just in case that I could be skipping something, the ego could get control. Um, yeah, so call me out. Mm. I am upset because I see what is not there. I am upset because I see what is not there. Reality is never frightening. It is impossible that it could upset me. Reality brings only, reality brings only perfect peace. When I am upset, it is always because I have replaced reality with illusions which I made up. The illusions are upsetting because I have given them reality and thus 
regard reality as an illusion. Nothing in God's creation is affected in any way by this confusion of mine. I am always upset by nothing. I see only the past. As I look about, I condemn the world I look upon. I call this scene. I hold the past against everyone and everything, making them my enemies. When I have forgiven myself, and remembered who I am. I will bless everyone and everything I see. There will be no past and therefore no enemies. And I will look with love on all that I had failed to see before. I'm gonna do one more. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. I see only my own thoughts and my mind is preoccupied with the past. What then can I see as it is? Let me remember that I look on the past to prevent the present from dawning on my mind. Let me understand that I am trying to use time against God. Let me learn to give the past away, realizing that in so doing, I am giving up nothing. Bernadette, you want to read a few? Hey, everybody, Bernadette's in the house. <laughs> um, are you like going by? As what doesn't really matter, or mm -mm, I'm going in order. Did I did I skip something? No, no, no. I just I'm, I just didn't know what are the the rules oh. <laughs> of engagement. The rules okay. we just we just let Holy Spirit take over, but. But we don't, okay. he, put it, he put it in this arrangement, so we're going to follow this arrangement. All <laughs> right. Because the method I is hear. madness. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm already reading from the FIP, if that's okay. I don't know. Oh, it's okay. perfect. Thank you. I see nothing as it is now. If I see nothing as it is now, it can surely be said that I see nothing. I can see only what I what is now. The choice is not whether to see the past or the present. The choice is merely whether to see or not. What I have chosen to see has cost me vision. Now I would choose again that I may see. Mm. My thoughts do not mean anything. I have no private thoughts. Yet it's only private thoughts of which I am aware. What can these thoughts mean? They do not exist, and so they mean nothing. Yet my mind is part of creation, 
and part of its creator. Would I not rather join the thinking of the universe than to obscure all that I really or obscure all that I what what is really mine with my pitiful and meaningless private thoughts. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do the last sentence yeah, again because yeah, it did breath. not absolutely absolutely just take a breath love. Mm. <laughs> Would I not rather join the thinking of the universe? than to obscure all that is really mine with my pitiful and meaningless private thoughts. Mm. Mm. <laughs> oh, oof. Should I do one more? Is Absolutely. it trees? Is that how you do it? No, we do until we don't. <laughs> okay. 53, less than 53. My meaningless thoughts are showing me a meaningless world. Since the thoughts of which I'm aware do not mean anything, the world that pictures them can have no meaning. Mm. What is producing this world is insane. And so is what it produces. Reality is not insane. And I have, and I have real thoughts as well as insane ones. I can therefore see the real world if I look to my real thoughts as my guide for seeing. Should do a few more. <laughs> I am upset because I see a meaningless world. Insane thoughts are upsetting, that's for sure. They produce a world in which there is no order anywhere. Only chaos rules the world that represents chaotic thinking. And chaos has no laws. Yeah. I cannot live in peace in such a world. I am grateful that this world is not real and that I need not see it at all unless I choose to value it. And I do not choose to value what is totally insane and has no meaning. Mm -hmm. A meaningless world engenders fear The totally insane engenders fear because it is completely undependable and offers no grounds for trust. Mm -hmm. Nothing in madness is dependable. It holds out no safety and no hope. For such a world is not real. <sighs> I have given it an illusion of reality. And I have suffered from my belief in it. Now I choose to withdraw this belief and place my trust in reality. In choosing this, I will escape all the effects of the world of fear because I am acknowledging that I does not exist. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can you unmute yourself? I did. Isn't that how you guys do it? I don't know. I I thought maybe it would be not good if I leave my volume on. Is it okay if I leave it on? I don't. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a problem unless you get you know, <laughs> unless a band comes through your <laughs> your space. You're fine. The, the only way, the only reason why because I, I sometimes cough and I know that's like screw up your audio or whoever's yeah. reading, right? So. Well, I was actually talking to Anna. I didn't know if she could unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But but yeah, whatever. It's all cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on now. Now I can. can. I can hear you. No, I, yeah, I think I muted you, so I needed to ask you to unmute. I think I don't know, but anyway, we'll see. Oh, uh, well, we'll see. We'll see if it keeps working. <clears throat> God did not create a meaningless world. How can a meaningless world exist if God did not create it? He is the source of all meaning and everything that is real is in his mind. It is in my mind too because he created it with me. Why should I continue to suffer from the effects of my own insane thoughts when the perfection of creation is my home? Let me remember the power of my decision and recognize where I really abide. My thoughts are images that I have made. Whatever I see reflects my thoughts. Whatever I see reflects my thoughts. It is my thoughts that tell me where I am and what I am. The fact that I see a world in which there is suffering and loss and death shows me that I am seeing only the representation of my insane thoughts and I'm not allowing my real thoughts to cast their beneficent light on what I see. Yet God's way is sure. <laughs> The images I have made cannot prevail against him because it is not my will that they do so. My will is his and I will place no other gods before him. I have no neutral thoughts. Neutral thoughts are impossible because all thoughts have power. They will either make a false world or lead me to the real one. But thoughts cannot be without effects. As the world I see arises from my thinking errors, so will the real world rise before my eyes as I let my errors be corrected. My thoughts cannot be neither true nor false. They must be one or the other. What I see shows me which they are. Uh, 
I see no neutral things. I see no neutral things. What I see witnesses to what I think. If I did not think I would not exist because life is thought. Let me look on the world I see as the representation of my own state of mind. I know that my state of mind can change. And so I also know the world I see can change as well. I am not alone in experiencing the effects of my seeing. If I have no private thoughts, I cannot see a private world. Even the mad idea of separation had to be shared before it could form the basis of the world I see. Yet that sharing was a sharing of nothing. I can also call upon my real thoughts, which share everything with everyone. As my thoughts of separation call to the separation thoughts of others, so my real thoughts awaken the real thoughts in them. In the world, my real thoughts show me. <laughs> In the world, my real thoughts show me will dawn on their sight as well as mine. I am not alone in experiencing the effects of my thoughts. I am alone in nothing. I am alone in nothing. Everything I think or say or do teaches all the universe. A son of God cannot think or speak or act in vain. He cannot be alone in anything. It is therefore in my power to change every mind along with mine. For mine is the power of God. You'll have to mute me. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you would want to read this next one. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, this is yours. Okay, I'll mute you. Thank you. I am determined to see. I am determined to see.
recognizing the shared nature of my thoughts, I am determined to see. I would look upon the witnesses that show me the thinking of the world has been changed. I would behold the proof that what has been done through me has enabled love to replace fear, laughter to replace weeping, and abundance to replace loss. I would look upon the real world and let it teach me that my will and the will of God are one. I am determined to see things differently. What I see now are but signs of disease, disaster, and death. This cannot be what God created for his beloved son. The very fact that I see such things is proof that I do not understand God. Therefore, I also do not understand his son. What I see tells me that I do not know who I am. I am determined to see the witnesses to the truth in me rather than those which show me an illusion of myself. One more. What I see is a form of vengeance. The world I see is hardly the representation of loving thoughts. It is a picture of attack on everything and by everything. It is anything but a reflection of the love of God and the love of his son. It is my own attack thoughts which give rise to this picture. My loving thoughts will save me from this perception of the world and give me the peace God intended me to have. We'll do one more. I can escape from the world by giving up attack thoughts. Herein <laughs> lies my salvation and nowhere else. Without attack thoughts, I could not see a world of attack. As forgiveness allows love to return to my awareness, I will see a world of peace and safety and joy. And it is this I choose to see in place of what I look on now. Bernadette, you're going to read it to you. Hey, Megan. Megan. <laughs> hey, Megan. <laughs> I do not perceive my best interest.
how could I recognize rec recognize my own best interest when I do not know who I am? what I think are my best interest would merely blind me closer to the world of illusions. I am willing to follow the guide God has given me to find out what my own best interests are. Recognizing that I cannot perceive them by myself. I do not know what anything is for. To me, the purpose of everything is to prove that my illusions about myself are real. It is for this purpose that I attempt to use everyone and everything. It is for this that I believe the world is for. Therefore, I did not recognize its real purpose. The purpose I have given the world has led to the frightening picture of it. Let me open my mind, please. to the world of real purpose by withdrawing the one I have given it and learning the truth about it. My attack darts are attacking my invulnerability. How can I know who I am? When I see myself as under constant attack, pain, illness, loss, age, and death seems to threaten me. All my hopes and wishes and plans appear to be the mercy of the world I cannot control. Yet perfect security and complete fulfillment are my inheritance. I have tried to give my inheritance away in exchange for the world I see. But God has kept my inheritance safe for me. My own real thoughts will teach me what it is. One more. Oh, above else, I want to see above else, I want to see recognizing that what I see reflects what I think I am. I realize the vision is my greatest need. <laughs> the world I see attests to the fearful nature of the self image I have made. If I would remember who I am, it is essential that I let this image of myself go. As it is replaced by truth, vision will surely be given me. And with this vision, I will look upon the world and on myself with the charity and love. Thank you. Do one more. Do the next one. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic to you. 
Above else, I want to see differently. The world I see holds my fearful self-image in place and guarantees its continu continuance. While I see the world as I see it now, truth cannot enter my awareness. I would let the door behind the world be open for me. That I may look past to the world that reflects the love of God. God, God is in everything I see. Behind every image I have made, the truth remains unchanged. Behind every veil I have drawn across the face of love, it is the light remains undimmed. Beyond all my insane wishes is my will. My will united with the will of my father. God is still everywhere in everything I in forever. And we who are part of him will look past all appearances and recognize the truth beyond them all. Good. Now read that one again, but this time, let go of the guilt, let go of the story, close your eyes for a second, take a few deep breaths, I'm going to give you an imaginary scenario, imagine a naughty boy at school goes into the chemistry room and he loves chemistry. It's his favourite thing. But he's not supposed to be in there without the teacher's supervision. But he can't help himself. He just has to go in there and play with things because he loves the results of mixing one thing with another. And he makes a big explosion. And he wrecks the chemistry room. And he gets in so much trouble, like he does so much damage, that none of the other children can do any chemistry. They have to fix the room. And he starts to feel really, really bad for, for the other children and for everything. He starts to feel guilty. And he starts to lose his interest in chemistry because of it. Okay? But okay. the other children, they see how sad he feels and the teacher sees how sad he feels at what he's done. And they gather around him and they tell him, don't be sad because in your ignorance, you've done something incredible. And it's no loss to any of us to suffer the loss of the chemistry room because you invented something that is going to help our lives without limit. Now, in just the same way, there's a guilt inherent in the mind that believes that it has caused the suffering of humanity and caused the split from reality. But it's not true. In truth, something has occurred, albeit illusory, that has enabled the expression of love to be felt and heard and extended in a place that was designed to deny it. It's the most incredible thing in the universe and you're a part of that. 
But until you accept that you're a part of that, you cannot not experience this from the guilt of thinking that you've done something wrong. Nothing wrong ever occurred. But when you go through the lessons in the course, it brings up your guilt so that you can heal from it. It brings up your sadness so that you can heal from it. It brings up all of that. It's a journey into fear. But in reality, everybody is dancing around, clapping their hands with joy at your incredible efforts. It's amazing. It's incredible. But it's you now that has to come out of the coma, out of the dream, out of the illusion of guilt and denial to realize the truth of what's actually occurring here. You're literally living in the resurrection, Bernadette. You couldn't screw this up if you wanted to. You couldn't get it wrong if you wanted to. But the ability for you to now be able to play your part within it to help speed up the collapse of that um, residual potential and time that's contained in your own timeline that's why we do the course. That's why we have the course. We don't have to do anything. We can just sit on a bench by the park and feed the pigeons until the end of time. 130 billion years. One lifetime, one world, one universe after the next, after the next, after the next. But that's kind of boring, you know? Like I look out at the world and I'm like, all right, I've done everything here. There's nothing else I want. It all ends the same way. What's the point? Let's be about our father's business and collapse all this time in our own association, you know, so we can have an experience. And then from that experience, come back, perhaps, and represent the truth in a place designed to deny it, to find ourselves as the living call, the living call of God. Everyone who embarks upon this journey automatically becomes part of God's voice, automatically becomes part of that call to awaken. You may not even be aware of it. It may take you an incredible amount of effort and determination and doing those lessons and prayer and meditation to actually get to a point where a little light bulb goes on in your mind and you're like, oh my God, I'm part of God in this world. In this world, I'm, I'm not a Bernadette or an Anna or a Dave. I'm part of God disguised as a Bernadette, you know. But the place where that is an idea in your mind and the place where the light bulb comes on, where that actually meets in you, is a whole other thing where we collapse time to bring that to the here and the now. You may get glimpses of it and you may have holy instants and you may have other experiences and whatever, but until it becomes your working platform, until it becomes your regular um, state of mind or state of being, there's going to be this kind of up and down with it, you know, like a kind of a like today I'm feeling really good and yesterday I was shit and tomorrow, oh my God, how do I face the day? There's all these kinds of moments, moments, moments. And, uh, you know, you get to a point where you get out of bed in the morning and it's just your automatic recognition that today is going to be a day where you want to find your fear today is a day where i'm consciously looking for my limitations i want to find them so i can heal from them because anything else is just delay it doesn't mean that you uh, don't do things and quit your job and whatever all doesn't mean any of that stuff but it just means you become more conscious, more focused, more self-aware of what's actually going on in your own thinking in the relationships that are presented with you throughout the day and in the situations when you're finding yourself in uh, perhaps moments of mind wandering. You know, and Jesus says in the course, you're far too tolerant of mind wandering. It's like sometimes I remember I used to drive my car to work or something and somebody would cut in front of me and uh, I'd be like, God damn, you know, and I have this whole moment go on there. And my mind would dwell on that moment for like the rest of the drive into work, you know, like 20 minutes or whatever. I'd be still thinking about people cutting me off. And it's like, why? You know, let's be here and now. That happened. It's done. 
let's be here and now. But the place where you read these lessons is in the here and now, is in the acceptance of my guiltlessness, is in the acceptance of my perfection. Sure, I've still got the work to do. Sure, I've still got to uncover my guilt. Sure, I've still got all this other stuff, which is why I have 365 lessons. But let me accept to whatever degree I can my perfection and sinlessness, sinlessness as God created me because that's actually the truth of me regardless of my beliefs to the contrary. Most people in the world would say, well, that's a bit arrogant. Nobody's perfect here. True, nobody is perfect here. But I'm not referring to myself as here. I'm no longer referencing myself as a body in time and space but rather as mind experiencing itself seemingly separate from itself in a dream of denial, which I'm now awakening from. You know, So it's like, all right, I've got a choice. I can read this from a place of like ignorance as if I don't know the truth, or I can read this from a place of perfection and sinlessness, which I also may not have a, comp a comprehension of in my mind, but which one do I want? Right? I have to make a choice. I'm not guilty. I'm a child of God. And all the mistakes I make along the way to self-realization and whatever, they're not really mistakes. They're opportunities to learn better. They're opportunities <laughs> to remember better. You know, So it makes no sense really when you see it that way to beat yourself up for those things. It's like, okay, I fucked that up. Now I'll keep going. And you learn to laugh at yourself. You learn to, to take yourself less seriously and more lightly and you know, until finally you realize there's no such thing as a mistake. There's no such thing as an error. Nothing ever went wrong. <laughs> now, read from that place. Feel it in your heart. Feel a connection. Heart is the passion. Mind is the decision maker. Make the choice with the passion of the heart. Connect the two things. If it's just in the head, it's just going to be lip service. If it's just in the heart, you're going to be kind of like absent-minded and not really know what the hell, right? Put the two things together. Then read it again. God is in everything I see. Right. <sighs> Behind every image I have made, the truth remains unchanged. <laughs> Be behind every veil I have drawn across the face of love, the light remains undimmed. <laughs> I, beyond all my insane wishes is my will united with the will of my father. God is still everywhere and in everything forever and ever and ever. <laughs> and we who are part of him will yet look all past appearances and recognize the truth behind them all. Good. There's a warmth there. There's a nice warmth and a feeling just stay there in that place. That warmth will actually open you up to more healing, to more opportunity. The more you become aware of that within yourself, the more you become aware of that presence, that, that sense, the greater the contrast will appear to be in your mind when you're not finding yourself there and the more inescapable it will be for you to try and deny the darkness in you okay now in reality there's no such thing as darkness in you but we're not talking about reality we're talking about an illusion a dream a false belief which we are now exposing to the light but first we've got to find it we've got to find where it lives in us in our thought system bit by bit or maybe all at once if you have enough courage but bit by bit generally it's a slowly evolving training program and one day at a time, 
It's like St. John. I died daily, every day. Let me look for something. Let me be aware and open to face my fears today. Megan. How's the trip? <laughs> you didn't enjoy Let's not that. Let's mention huh? the word trip, okay? <laughs> Let's. We're just gonna stay out of that word. <laughs> you know that's. You know that's a really cool thing, right? 